Well, Matthew Brabham, uh, welcome back home uh, under tragic circumstances. Uh, must have been a roller coaster of emotions. Uh, firstly, uh, the loss of your uh, very famous grandfather, Sir Jack Brabham, and, uh, and to reflect on uh, what uh, was a remarkable life. Yeah, I know it was. Um it was, it was a little bit unexpected. Well, no, it wasn't so much unexpected, but it was just a little bit of a shock for all of us while we were over there in the States. And um, yeah, I know it was definitely it was definitely sad. And we had that race weekend coming right up. So, um, you know, as Lee Dad said at the funeral, um, you know, he would have been kicking in his grave if uh, we had missed a race just for his funeral. So we had to get through all of that racing and come back over here. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely been tough you know, kind of dealing with that in racing, but, um, you know, I mean, I just have to be happy for his, for his incredible life. You almost pulled off a remarkable and fitting win in the Freedom 100 at Indianapolis. It must have been very painful to come so close. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it was, it was painful for sure. I could, I could see his nose cone and it was so quick that I didn't really know what it, you know, I, I was still, I kind of figured that I had lost the race, but I still wasn't 100% sure. And so I got on the radio and I was yelling at the team, who won, who won? And there was just death, deathly silence over the radio and they didn't want to say anything. So when I didn't get anything back and they were just dead quiet, I kind of knew what, what had happened. And uh, eventually, like quite, quite later on the lap, they told me and they, were, they seemed just as sad as I was. So. Yeah, I mean, it was a strong race, and I had a lot of fun racing, and, but, you know, I just, just wish I had that 0 0.05 a little bit quicker just to, just to get that race win. It would have been, you know, a story tail ending, I guess. Um, but it, it just didn't, it wasn't my weekend, and it just didn't quite get it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I just got to still remain positive and happy. You know, I was there, and, you know, when losing by 0 0.05 sucks, but, you know, it's, it's still pretty close. Sir Jack took a lot of interest in your career, firstly when you were racing go-karts and Formula Fords in Australia. How much influence has he had on what you're currently doing? I mean, it, it, was, it was massive to him. I mean, he really got a lot of enjoyment out of, you know, getting the race reports from myself, uh, especially even in go-karting. He would come out to my go-kart races here in Coomera when I, you know, first started racing and then he kind of just followed my career and was very very interested and always asking me questions and what's the team doing, how are you doing, what's going on here, what's going on there and uh, yeah I mean it, I guess it kind of gave him that just something to follow and something to look forward to um, you know later on in his life and um, you know he was he was very supportive of me and uh, yeah I mean he, and, he, and, he, and, he was, and he was funny about it as well you know some of the advice he would give me and uh, I mean he just he, I think he just loves racing and he's loved it his whole life so it kind of just gave him that little bit of a spark in his eye when he heard that Sam and I started racing as well. Can you describe how big the jump was from the Pro Mazda series to Indy Lights? Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a huge jump. I um, obviously went from the USF 2000 car up to the Pro Mazda. And when I, when I did that jump, it, it wasn't actually so big as what I thought it would be. And I kind of got in and was quick straight away. Whereas the Indy Lights car, it, it hasn't kind of worked out that way. I've kind of got in and had to really work at it and uh, really try and focus on my driving and how to drive the car in a particular way that, it, that is fast. And uh, it's been quite challenging for me. It's, it's, uh, there's a few little differences. I think the biggest one is the weight of the car has been the hardest thing for me to get used to. It kind of feels like a, a train of carriages are pushing you kind of into the corner because there's so much momentum behind the car. Um, and you know, once I've kind of got used to that, then it, everything's slowly clicking into place now. But yeah, for sure, the first couple of races of the season didn't quite go to plan. Um, and, you know, obviously it's starting to pick up now a little bit. And, you know, the more and more I drive the car, the more uncomfortable I get and the more used to it I get. So I think, you know, now I'm definitely in a position to kind of, you know, challenge for race wins. You cracked your first Indy Lights victory on the IMS road course at Indianapolis. How important was that victory? Oh, it was, it was incredibly important. You know, I never, you, you had the whole, you know, persona of the race in the first inaugural Grand Prix there. And to, to win a race at Indy is pretty special. So to get that first one under the belt as well as winning it at Indy was very, very cool. And, uh, you know, it was also one of those races that was, you know, wet and slick and different conditions going on. And uh, I was pretty proud of myself. I was able to beat all the Europeans kind of in the, in the wet weather conditions. I know a lot of those guys are really experienced, but um, for sure it's given me a lot of momentum. And I think, you know, I think I 
probably had the quickest car over the last three two races since then at you know the Indy 500 and the, and the next race after that. So hopefully I can carry that car speed and that and that raw speed that we we've found and just kind of carry it through the rest of the season and see how it goes. You seem to have settled in well in America and with the Andretti Autosport family. How different was it to adjust from the Gold Coast way of life? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I kind of, I basically just graduated high school here and then the next week I missed out on schoolies and I went straight to the States and I've pretty much been there for the last, you know, three, this will be my third year there. So, you know, I had all my friends and all my family here. I spent my whole entire life growing up here and I kind of just went straight to another country. And, you know, a lot of the time I was on my own because mom and dad were here working and looking after, the, you know, my dog and things like that. And so, um, yeah, I was, I was on there a lot on my own and I didn't really know many people there. Um, but, you know, luckily I had a lot of friends um, from my dad's side, you know, older guys that kind of took me under their wing and, and showed me around. And, um, you know, the racing community over there is very, very open. So it was easy for me to kind of slot in. Um, but, you know, I think it was, it was, you know, I definitely miss the beaches. I think that's the biggest thing. I, I, I like it over in America and I really, really enjoy it. And I've had a lot of fun there and it's and had a lot of success there. But yeah, they're just, their beaches do not compare to anything here on the Gold Coast. I think I'm a little bit spoiled growing up here. <laughs> With such a big chunk of his career spent in IMSA and in IndyCar in the US, your father, Jeffrey, has obviously been quite a, a guiding hand so far in your American career. Yeah, you know, it's been, he's been great. Um, you know, he's known a lot of people there. Obviously, he was um, Michael Andretti's teammate back in IndyCar. So I've got that link now to Andretti and I've been driving for them last year and this year. So hopefully I can, you know, keep things going with them and hopefully move up into their IndyCar team. But, you know, just having those little, you know, you know, old long friend, old long term friend relationships that dad has with these people in the States is huge and, and it really, really helps. And I think, you know, dad doesn't really quite have that in Europe. So um, there's a lot more opportunities that are opening up for me in, in the States, especially. And I think it's probably been the, the right career move for me to kind of go there just because we, we know a lot of people there. And uh, it's, it's been a really big help having him obviously also on the driving side of things, coaching me. And uh, he's been on the ovals before and helping me with the oval, you know, adjusting to o racing on ovals and, and little things like that. You know, he's kind of been through that route in America and done it all before. So there's a lot of knowledge that he can pass on to me. There must have been no shortage of people in the IndyCar scene who have been helpful along your way in IndyCar this year, notwithstanding your boss, Michael Andretti. How have you been able to take all that in? Um, I mean, it's definitely tough sometimes. I think, you know, you can definitely overwhelm yourself with too much information. And it's, it's kind of funny. It, it doesn't really matter who it is, but everybody has different points of view on different things, you know. So you listen to, to Michael and he says something about this and you listen to, you know, Al Unser or someone else or Bobby Rahal and they say something else. And I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, taking in the information that, you know, suits you best. And you kind of think, oh, you know, that when I did that, that really, you know, I, I really understood that and that really made a difference for me. So you just kind of think that, you know, one of the, the best advice that my dad is giving me is just take parts from every, what everybody says and kind of just create your own, you know, ideal, ideals out of it. And, and whatever suits you the best, that's what you got to do. So, um, I mean, it's definitely been been cool listening to what they have to say. And, and then it's been a really, really great help. I know the you know, it's not only just Michael, it's also the IndyCar drivers that he has come down through and they, you know, are interested in how we're doing in qualifying because usually, you know, they're on track straight after us. So they're, oh, well, how is it in qualifying? So we kind of help them out a little bit and, and they also help out, us out a little bit. If, if they're on track before us, they'll tell us what the track's kind of doing, what the conditions are, where they went with setup. And a lot of the times what they have to say really kind of helps us out and, and, and translates in what we do. Your next race is at Pocono, a place you've never raced at before. Your father had one of his greatest escapes there in the 80s. What has he told you about the place they call the Tricky Triangle? Um, a little bit. I mean, he's kind of told me some of those stories. Obviously, he had a, a scary moment with the, the steering rack coming off and not being able to turn the car and just being a passenger. And, and luckily, he scathed out of that one. So listening to those stories, it kind of makes me a little bit nervous. But... Um, I mean, it's just an, it's just another track, really, and I think it's going to be flat out for us. Um, and, and it's hard to tell whether it will be a slipstreaming fest like it was at the Indianapolis 
um, 500 for us. I'm not sure if it's going to be the same just because it's a little bit more challenging, I think, than the Indy 500 circuit. So we'll just see how we go, but I think it's going to be flat out. And, um, you know, we had a really strong car at Indy, so hopefully we can just carry that over into Pocono and, and see what we can come up with. Coming through the IndyCar ladder system, is there any chance, Matthew, that you might just test an IndyCar this season? Um, I mean, it's not something that we've really, um, you know, honed in on and, and tried to focus on. I think, you know, I've just been kind of focusing on what I'm doing this year in Indy Lights. Um, but if, if anybody came up to me and said, hey, you want to drive this, this Indy car, I would, I would for sure say yes. It's not something I'm going to say no to. So, um, but it, it was funny enough, there was an opportunity last year with a, a filming crew that were doing something. And I, and I almost got an opportunity to do that and drive the Indy car, which would have been the coolest thing ever. Just even if it was just, you know, around the car park doing a filming, it would have been cool just to drive the car. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, Andretti is kind of good with that as well where they don't want to put any extra pressure on you and do anything like that. So I think, you know, they're just trying to make sure I focus on this year and I'm trying to focus on this year and not get distracted by, you know, oh, I've got to move up to IndyCar or i got to test this car or that car. And I'm just focusing on the championship this year and hopefully I can win the championship and then move up onto IndyCars. But uh, there's no, been no real talks about testing a car or anything, but, you know, I'd love to. I mean, it'd be, it'd be really great to, to kind of get it, cut a few laps in one of those things. They look really fun to drive. Obviously, your career is being crafted in America, but are there any natural leanings towards Europe or, in fact, an F1 career in the future? Um, for sure. I mean, I, I'm not really sure how that would play out. You know, it's always tough to kind of move over there and, and follow the Formula One path. Obviously, it's, uh, it's one of the... It's obviously the hardest path in motor racing to kind of become successful in. Um, but it, it's always been a goal of mine, for sure. I've always kind of kept it in the back of my mind that I would always want to kind of go over and do a Formula One race or, you know, compete in the Formula One championship and follow my grandfather's footsteps. I think that would be really, really cool. Um, but it, it's just really, it, you just kind of have to, to weigh up your opportunities and what's best for you and make sure, you know, actually get something out of your career because there's a lot of people that kind of go the Formula One path and kind of end up nowhere. So I don't want to end up like that. And I'm just going to take the best opportunities I can get. But, you know, I'd always love to kind of go over there. I think it'd be really cool to do that. But, um, you know, at the moment, there's no real plans. I, I did a couple of races in England um, last, at the end of last year and the, the year before, the end of a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, those races went quite well. But it's just, it's just so tough with budget over there. And at the moment, I don't really have a, a good opportunity to move over there. So I'll just kind of focus here and focus in the States on IndyCar. Matthew Brabham, thanks for joining us here at speedcafe.com and we wish you all the best for the remainder of the season. Awesome.